The 1500s was a transitional period, where Europe moved from a medieval to a modern society. We saw the centralization and foundations of modern states, the birth of capitalism, and various philosophical concepts such as humanism. There were also major technological efforts which rapidly changed society. The printing press allowed for a mass production of books. But of course, books are boring, and epic military history is fun. People thought the same in the 1500s, which saw a great deal of military innovations. But transitional periods are hardly stable. A lot of experimentation has to be done before stabilization occurs, and something reliable is settled upon. This meant that there was a lot of weird weapons in the 1500s, ranging from a sort of tank to the dreaded mushroom gun. Of course, in this video, I'll only really be touching on weaponry from Renaissance Scandinavia, since that's where I got most of my knowledge. But don't worry, we had a lot of weird weaponry, and some were used abroad as well. I will additionally include a few from outside of Scandinavia. In military history, this period is often termed the Pike and Shot era. Infantry armies were divided between units of pikemen and arquebusiers. Both of them fought in square formations, but the arquebusiers were only meant to pepper the enemy before falling back behind the pikes during melee combat. The term pike and shot has always implied to me that previous weapon systems died out, only to be replaced by standardized pikes and guns, which isn't true. In Sweden, the crossbow remained a mainstay weapon until the turn of the century. Whilst the army readily adapted firearms, the crossbow was the favorite weapon of militiamen, city watchmen, and the peasantry. Crossbows were used very effectively by peasant rebels in the province of Småland, during an uprising called the Ducky War. The Smålander peasants were fed up with taxes, and wanted to preserve their Catholic faith against the king's Protestant reforms. In response, the king sent down German Landsknechts with pikes, guns and trumpets. Whilst the marching mercenaries were experts in the open field, their formations were useless in the dark forests. Their garish uniforms made them easy targets. Peasants created roadblocks and harried the mercenaries with their crossbows. The woods have always been a great friend for the underdogs of Swedish society, and the peasants were able to fight an effective guerrilla war. To this day, the small and coat of arms is a lion holding a crossbow. Crossbows had a body made from wood, and a bow made from horn or steel. Horn bows were more expensive and not used as much. Steel bows could cause more damage, but since you can't bend a steel bow with human strength alone, mechanical assistance was needed for reloading. For this, the Swedes primarily used a goose foot, typically called a goat's foot in English. This was a sort of lever which you cocked backwards to draw the bow. A more complicated loading mechanism was the German-made Kronequin. By cranking the lever, you cocked the bow and brought the string over to the nut. When you pulled the crossbow trigger, the nut fell down and released the string, losing the bow. A more simple reloading mechanism was the Simpson belt. This was a belt with a rope attached to it, at the end of which was a hook. To load the crossbow, the shooter bent forward, allowing him to attach the hook to the crossbow's bowstring. When he bent backwards, the Simpson rope would stretch and cock the crossbow. After a long day of crossbow shooting, I'd imagine you'd have some back problems. Crossbows were loaded with a short arrow called a bolt, and there were different types of bolts available. Bolts meant for hunting birds had blunt arrowheads. These could also be used to pacify a human target without killing them, a bit like rubber bullets used by today's law enforcement. The heavily forested hillbilly country of Sweden, Dalarna, had always been home to a stout and rebellious people, who were instrumental in Gustav Vasa's rise to power. They had designed their own bolt, called the Dalpil or Dalbolt. It is nowadays a symbol of freedom, and features on Dalarna's coat of arms. A quiver typically carried eight dozen bolts, and a bolt could travel up to 350 meters. However, it was near impossible to aim a crossbow beyond 90 meters. The peasantry also used spears, but their favorite weapon was the spiked club, internationally called morning stars or goan dogs. These were long and could pull a knight off his horse, and also penetrate armor. They were a deadly weapon, and the namesake of the club worn in Finland, where peasant rebels clubbed their noble lords to death. To the Swedish nobility, the spiked club was a dreaded symbol of peasant rebellion. Soldiers and mercenaries either used halberds, a combination of an axe and a spear, or long pikes. However, the pike proved really inefficient at woodlands combat in the Ducky War. There just wasn't enough space to maneuver with a pike or battle in formations. The king planned on largely abolishing pikemen from his army and replacing them entirely with arquebusiers. 
However, he had to change his mind in the Russian war, when Swedish pikemen were necessary to counter the Russian cavalry. Now onto guns. The Swedish army of the 1500s used arquebuses, rifles, long pipes and pistols. Arquebuses were similar to later carbines. Made in Germany, they had bronze barrels and were around a meter long. They fired a lead bullet about 14 millimeters in dimension. Now, most guns have historically been smoothbore, meaning that the inside of the barrel was completely smooth. This gave the discharge bullet an unpredictable and inaccurate trajectory. In the 1800s, industrial machinery allowed the mass production of rifled barrels, meaning that they had a spiral groove that caused the bullet to spin and travel more predictably. Though we often see smoothbore guns referred to as rifles, this is completely inaccurate. Before the Industrial Revolution, actual rifles were virtually unheard of. However, in the 1500s, rifles were, weirdly enough, quite widespread throughout Sweden and Germany. Somehow, gunsmiths were able to painstakingly cut spiral grooves in the barrel of the arquebuses. In 1587, we know that a drilling mill using water power was instituted at Jädersholm in Sweden. However, most of the rifling would have been done by hand, by the same urban gunsmiths that made barrels and locks. When discussing pre-industrial rifles, most gun nuts would tell you that they were relegated to the nobility, for leisure such as sharpshooting competitions. But during the reign of Erik XIV, the schizo king of Sweden, we know that 1,500 men were equipped with rifles. I really have no idea how these riflemen operated in terms of tactics. It seems like the rifle also fell out of fashion after the 1500s, probably because it was hard to mass produce and standardize. Almost as good as the rifle was the long pipe. This was really as the really long smoothbore arquebus, similar to the musket developed in the late 1500s. In 1560, around 300 soldiers were equipped with long pipes. According to Gustav Vasa himself, he trained them to shoot accurately and not randomly. I should also mention that at this point, Sweden did not use any imported names for guns, so most of them were just called as some variation of rör, meaning pipe. Pistols were called saddle pipe or belt pipe, for example. I imagine this was the case in other countries. The term pistol derives from the Czech word pistol, which was their term for early handheld firearms. Germans called their pistols puffer, which I actually kinda like. That brings me on to the star of this video, the mushroom gun. Sadly, it did not shoot mushrooms. Rather, the mushroom was how the gun itself was fired. You see, a gun is discharged by having some sort of ignition system igniting the main propellant, or gunpowder charge. During the Renaissance, most of these ignition systems were matchlock, meaning a piece of burning rope boiled in saltpeter. These slow matches were not made in Sweden and had to be imported. So, to save money, the Swedes used a tinderlock, or svamplås, which used a piece of amadou, or tinder. This is a sort of dried fungi that grows on trees. Svamplås literally means mushroom lock. Aside from match locks and mushroom locks, there was also the wee lock and snap lock. The wee lock was very complicated and expensive to produce, but very reliable. It appeared on a few long arms, but appeared mostly on pistols. They were used quite far into the Swedish history. Wee lock pistols have been recovered from the 1676 wreckage of Kronan. Snap locks, also called fire locks in Sweden, were an early flintlock, but much less reliable. One in five shots was a misfire. Just like the crossbow, they were especially popular in Småland. According to preserved documents of Erik XIV's army, 71% of the firelocks were mushroom locks, 25% were snap locks, and 4% were wee lock. Some historians believe that the development of artillery in the late Middle Ages largely contributed to the collapse of feudal society. Since heavy cannons were able to destroy medieval castles, local lords were unable to defend themselves against external enemies. This led to the creation of centralized states able to effectively harness resources and invest them into a professional, standing army that could defend its realm. Of course, the development of artillery was a slow process, and we saw a lot of weird weaponry here as well. For one, the Nordic countries used catapults well into the 1500s. These were virtually the same as the ones designed by the ancient Romans, and they flung big stones at castle walls. Whilst considerably weaker than cannons, they were cheap to produce. Another weakness was their inability to be used as field artillery. Now on to actual cannons. Cartons or cartogs were large pieces meant only for siege warfare. Field artillery consisted of slangor or schlangen, that means snake. 
These were long pieces flying six or three pound cannonballs. The falconet was a light piece that fired cannonballs of two to four pounds weight. So I mentioned before how rifles were only effectively implemented during the industrial revolution. The same applied for breech loading small arms and artillery. Loading a cannon from the back or breech is much simpler than having to load it from the front or muscle. However, without industrial processes, they were hard to create. Most cannons before the 1800s were muscle loaders. Except for Renaissance cannons. A lot of them were actually breech loaders. The back was just cut out, allowing the gun crew to just insert a massive metal cup loaded with powder and shot. They could keep multiple of these cups for faster loading. However, due to faulty metallurgy, these early breech loaders suffered from gas leakage, meaning reduced muscle velocity and power. That is why they were slowly abandoned. You'd imagine that most of these cannons fired iron shot, but no. Some of the heaviest siege pieces still fired stone shot, like those in the Middle Ages. Eric XIV had 12 stone guns, which he dubbed the Apostles. Swedish artillery pieces would bear similar charming nicknames, such as the Devil's Mother. The modern pieces fired iron shot, however. Most of these were just round, but there were some weird types of ammunition. Bar shot consisted of two smaller cannonballs connected by an iron bar. These were used at close range to cause a lot of devastation. Shane shot was two cannonballs connected by a chain. Pike shot was essentially a cannonball with a spike running through it. This ball would spin in the air and do more damage. Scissor shot looked like a goddamn scissor and was able to tear shit up. Another type of cannon were storm pieces and were essentially modern howitzers. They had short barrels and wide muscles and fired musket balls or metal junk like a massive shotgun. Additionally, I'd like to give a shout out to the hail shot piece. This was an English firearm with a rectangular muscle that fired iron dice. They were used aboard ships and were so heavy that they had to be steadied on the ship's railing. I'm not sure if they were used outside of England during the Renaissance. They might have had different names. The smallest artillery piece was the swivel gun. Both in English and Swedish and probably every other language, they went by like 5 million different names. Swedish names for the swivel gun included Dubbelhake, Telehake, Mikhake, Nikhake, etc. etc. It probably sounds like Bork 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 to most of you. Anyway, most of these were breech loaders and mostly fired scattering shot. According to the bishop, Olaus Magnus, swivel guns were equipped inside special wagons called cannon carts. If an army on the march came under attack, their supply train could form their wagons into a circular fort. The cannon carts were thus able to fire upon the attackers. This tactic was first revolutionized by the Czech Hussites, but was later adopted by Germans and Swedes. Essentially, they were medieval tanks. So basically, in 17th century Sweden, you had bulletproof knights next to sharpshooters, carrying rifles with mushroom locks, next to medieval catapults and tanks that fired spiked cannonballs. It all sounds like something from a steampunk novel. <laughs> <laughs>